Hello and welcome to the world of stuff with me, your host Sai. This podcast focuses on all the exciting stuff that goes on around the world and how it works. And each week we'll go through a different topic. Today, we're going to be talking about the evolution of horses. So let's just jump right into it. The horse is a hoof herbivore mammal, compromising of a single species called Equus calibus, whose numerous varieties are called breeds. Horses belong to a group called Parasodactyls or odd-toed ungulates. This group includes horses, tapirs, rhinos, and it contrasts with even-toed ungulates or certiodactyls. Even-toed ungulates include hippos, deer, giraffe, alpacas, and most common farm animals such as pigs, sheep, and cows. Also included are the crustaceans. The whales and dolphins, although they may have shed their toes on their journey to a streamlined aquatic life, we know from genetics and the shape of their skeletons that they share an ancestor with the rest of the even-toed ungulates. Certiodactyls are by far the most populous of the two ungulate groups today, but it wasn't always so. As their names suggest, the main way odd and even-toed ungulates are distinguished from each other is by how many toes they have on their hooves. Both groups share a common ancestry that reaches to just after the extinction of the non-avian dinosaurs around 66 million years ago, but the exact relationship between them remains unclear to paleontologists. In the 10 million years after the mass extinction, the first parasodactyls emerged called condyliths. Their odd feet have been reduced from five toes to only three. Tapirs and rhinos have stuck with this ever since. The evolutionary lineage of the horse is among the best documented in all paleontology. The first horses appeared around 56 million years ago, but you'd struggle to identify one in the wild. The first ancestral horse was designated as Hierocatherium, but more commonly called Eohippus, or the Dawn Horse. Fossils of Eohippus, which have been found in both North America and Europe, show an animal that stood between 42 centimetres and 50 centimetres tall, and had an arched back and raised hindquarters. The legs ended in padded feet, with four functional hooves on each of the forefeet and three on each of the hind feet, quite unlike the unpadded, single hoofed foot of modern equines. The skull lacked the large flexible muzzle of the modern horse, and the size and shape of the cranium indicate that the brain was far smaller and less complex than that of today's horse. The teeth too differed significantly from those of the modern equines, being adapted to a fairly general browsing diet. Eohippus was in fact so unhorse-like that its evolutionary relationship to the modern equines was at first unsuspected. It was not until paleontologists had unearthed fossils of later extinct horses that the link to Eohippus became clear. These earlier horses and their relatives lived in dense forests, where they browsed on foliage. Over the next 15 million years, as Earth's climate dried and cooled and forests were replaced by grasslands, some horses adapted to these new open landscapes. The evolutionary line leading from Eohippus to the modern horse exhibits the following evolutionary trends. Increase in size, reduction in the number of hooves, loss of the foot pads, lengthening of the legs, fusion of the independent bones of the lower legs, elongation of the muzzle, increase in the size and complexity of the brain, and development of crested, high crown teeth suited to grazing. This is not to imply that there was a steady, gradual progression in these characteristics, leading inevitably from those of Eohippus to the modern horse. Some of these features, such as grazing detention, appear abruptly in the fossil record rather than as the culmination of numerous gradual changes. Eohippus, moreover, gave rise to many now extinct branches of the horse family some of which differed substantially from the line leading to the modern equines. Although Eohippus fossils show they coexisted across the world, the subsequent evolution of the horse took place primarily in North America. The core evolution of these earlier horses was focused on their teeth, changing shape this year through tough grass instead of chewing soft leaves, and grew longer to counteract a lifetime of abrasion. These changes, which represented adaptations to a more specialised browsing diet, were retained by all subsequent ancestors of the modern horse. Around 8 million years ago, in one lineage of horses, the equine equids, the single middle toe, had become a sole waiting bearing hoof. They were the ancestors of today's horses. Equus, the genus to which all modern equines, including horses, asses and zebras belong, evolved from Philohippus some 4 million to 4.5 million years ago. This new form was extremely successful and had spread from the plains of North America to South America and then other parts of the world. Equus flourished in its North American homeland, but then, 
about 10,000 to 8,000 years ago, curiously disappeared from North and South America. Scholars have offered various explanations for this disappearance, including the emergence of devastating diseases or the arrival of human populations, which presumably hunted the horse for food. Despite these speculations, the reasons for the demise of Equus remain uncertain. Whatever happened in America to cause the disappearance of the horse, foragers in Europe and Asia continued to hunt horses and in some ways revere them. Cave paintings by early humans from Lascaux, France, that date to over 17,000 years ago, display renderings of horses and later human societies named constellations after the horse. The submergence of the Bering Land Bridge, landforms that once existed periodically and in various configurations between northeastern Asia and northwestern North America, often referring to large areas that intermittently linked present day North and Western Canada with northeastern Siberia and Russia, prevented any return migration of horses from Asia, and Equus was not reintroduced into its native continent until the Spanish explorers brought horses with them in the early 16th century back to America. The modern horse, Equus Calibus, became widespread from Central Asia to most of Europe. Local types of horses, all breeds of this one single species, undoubtedly developed, and three of these breeds, Chabowski's horse from Central Asia, the Tarpan from Eastern Europe, and the Ukrainian steppe, and a forest horse of Northern Europe, are generally credited as being the ancestral stock of the domestic horse. Chabowski's horse may be the last surviving distinct breed of wild horse, when compared genetically with domesticated horses. According to this line of thinking, Chabowski's horse and the Tarpan formed the basic breeding stock from which the southerly warm-blooded horses developed, while the forest horse gave rise to the heavy, cold-blooded breeds. The horse is worth ongoing research, not just because it is an evolutionary and biological marvel, but also because it's an anthropological one. Domestication of horses revolutionized human history, says Professor Ludwig Orlando from the Natural History Museum of Denmark. With horses, we traveled way faster and could transport goods, people, germs, and culture at unprecedented speed. In short, horse domestication is a turning point in history. Archaeological evidence indicates that the domestication of horses had taken place approximately 6,000 years ago in the steppe lands north of the Black Sea, from Ukraine to Kazakhstan, potentially mixing of local wild stock as they spread through Europe and Asia. Despite intensive study over a long period of time, many questions remain about the early development of the species as it underwent domestication. One crucial question involves whether domestication was limited to a single location or occurred in multiple areas. Tied to this question of origins is whether domesticated horses spread throughout Eurasia or whether the practice of horse domestication spread to new areas, with local breeders capturing their own wild horses and introducing them to the domestic horse gene pool. Results of studies of mitochondrial DNA, mtDNA, which is inherited only from the mother, showed a great deal of diversity among individuals and strongly supported the idea that wild horses from many different geographic areas contributed to the domestic horse. The mtDNA data clearly indicated that there were multiple sites of domestication, with a large number of mares in the first populations, and that genetic input from local wild horses had been introduced into the domestic gene pool as domesticated horses spread. The mtDNA data also showed that the modern horse is a mixture of ancient lineages, all of which can be traced back to an ancestral mare, which lived 130,000 to 160,000 years ago. In contrast, other studies have revealed that the domestic horse is dominated by a single paternally inherited Y chromosome lineage, in which there is almost no variation. The lack of variation on the Y chromosome would seem to indicate a very narrow origin for the domestic horse. However, the differences in variation between maternal and paternal lineages may reflect the differences in how breeders treated mares and stallions. It is possible that throughout history, far more mares contributed to the founding of the domestic horse than stallions. In addition, most selection is directed toward the males because at the level of the individual they can produce such a large number of offspring compared with females. In other words, it is likely that a small number of relatively cooperative stallions may have been used to impregnate a large number of mares. Based on archaeological evidence, it has long been thought that horse domestication originated in the western part of the Eurasian steppe, Ukraine, southwest Russia, and west Kazakhstan. However, a single origin in a geographically restricted area appeared at odds with a large number of female lineages in the domestic horse gene pool, commonly thought to reflect multiple domestication events across a wide geographic area. 
In order to solve the perplexing history of the domestic horse, scientists from the University of Cambridge used a genetic database of more than 300 horses sampled from across the Eurasian steppe to run a number of different modelling scenarios. Their research shows that the extinct wild ancestor of the domestic horses, Equus ferus, expanded out of East Asia approximately 160,000 years ago. They were able to demonstrate that Equus ferus was domesticated in the western Eurasian steppe and that herds were repeatedly restocked with wild horses as they spread across Eurasia. Dr. Vera Vamouf from the University of Cambridge's Department of Zoology said, Our research clearly shows that the original founder population of domestic horses was established in the western Eurasian steppe, an area where the earliest archaeological evidence for domesticated horses has been found. The spread of horse domestication differed from that of many other domestic animal species, in that spreading herds were augmented with local wild horses on an unprecedented scale. If these restocking events involved mainly wild mares, we can explain the large number of female lineages in the domestic horse gene pool without having to invoke multiple domestication origins. The research provides the first genetic evidence for a geographically restricted domestication origin in the Eurasian steppe, as suggested by archaeology, and show that the tremendous female diversity is a result of later introductions of local wild mares into domestic herds, thus reconciling evidence which had previously given rise to conflicting scenarios. At some point, no one is sure exactly when, but humans began to use horses for more than just food. Whether humans used horses to pull wheeled vehicles, such as chariots, or use for ploughing before they learned to ride them, is not certain, because most of these developments occurred before writing was invented. We depend on archaeological evidence to help us understand what happened. Horses pulling chariots are depicted in drawings from the Middle East about 4,000 years ago. The earliest evidence of humans riding horses is 5,000 year old fossils of worn down horse teeth that indicate a riding bit was placed in the animal's mouth. It is certainly possible that humans rode horses about bits long before that, but no physical evidence remains. In recent years, many scholars have embraced the hypothesis that the Bowtie or other inhabitants of the Eurasian steppe became the first people to tame the wild horse, Equus ferus, between 4,000 and 6,000 years ago. The Bowtie culture was a culture of foragers who seemed to have adopted horseback riding in order to hunt the abundant wild horses of northern Kazakhstan between 3,500 and 3,000 BCE. Bowtie settlements in this period contained between 50 to 150 pit houses. Garbage deposits contained tens to hundreds of thousands of discarded animal bones, 65% to 99% of which had come from horses. Also, there has been evidence found of horse milking at these sites, with horse milk fat soaked into pottery shards dating to 3500 BCE. Around 3500 to 3000 BCE, horse bones began to appear more frequently in archaeological sites beyond their centre of distribution in the Eurasian steppe. Evidence of horses in other areas had been rare before, and as numbers increased, larger animals also began to appear in horse remains. This expansion in range was contemporary for the Bowtie culture, where there are indications that horses were kept together and ridden. This does not necessarily mean that horses were first domesticated in the steppes, but the horse hunters of the steppes certainly pursued wild horses more than in any other region. This geographic expansion is interpreted by many zoologists as an early phase in the spread of domesticated horses. In northern Caucasus, the Mayakop culture settlements and burials of 3300 BC contained both horse bones and images of horses. A frieze of 19 horses painted in black and red colours is found in one of the Mayakop graves. The widespread appearance of horse bones and images in Mayakop sites suggests to some observers that horseback riding began in the Mayakop period. Later, images of horses identified by their short ears, flowing manes and tails that bushed out of the dock began to appear in artistic media in Mesopotamia during the Akkadin period 2300 to 2100 BCE. The word for horse, literally translated as ass off the mountains, first appeared in a Sumerian document during the third dynasty of Ur, about 2100 to 2000 BCE. The kings of the third dynasty of Ur apparently fed horses to lions for royal entertainment, perhaps indicating that horses were still regarded as more exotic than useful. The king Shulgi, about 2050 BCE, compared himself to a horse of the highway that swishes its tail and one image from his reign showed a man apparently riding a horse at full gallop. Horses were imported into Mesopotamia and the lowland near east in larger numbers after 2000 BCE, in connection with the beginning of chariot warfare. A further expansion into the lowland near east 
and northwestern China also happened around 2000 BC, again apparently in conjunction with a chariot. Although equus bones of uncertain species are found in some late Neolithic sites in China dated before 2000 BC, equus calibus or equus ferrous bones first appeared in multiple sites and in significant numbers in the sites of the Kujia and Sibia cultures 2000 to 1600 BC in Gansu and the northwestern provinces of China. The Kujia culture was in contact with cultures of the Eurasian steppes, as shown through similarities between Kujia and Late Bronze Age steppe meteorology, so it was probably through these contacts that domesticated horses first became frequent in northwestern China. The oldest possible archaeological indicator of a changed relationship between horses and humans is the appearance about 4800 to 4400 BC of horse bones and carved images of horses in catagolithic graves of the early Kilikovinsk culture and Samaran culture in the middle Volga region of Russia. At the Kilikovinsk cemetery near the town of Kilikovinsk, 158 graves of this period were excavated. Of these, 26 graves contained parts of sacrificed domestic animals, and additional sacrifices occurred in ritual deposits on the original ground surface above the graves. Ten graves contained parts of lower horse legs. Two of these also contained the bones of domesticated cattle and sheep. At least 52 domesticated sheep or goats, 23 domesticated cattle, and 11 horses were sacrificed at Kilikovinsk. The inclusion of horses with cattle and sheep and the exclusion of wild animals together suggests that horses were categorized symbolically with domesticated animals. At Siaz Hay, a contemporary cemetery of the Samara culture, parts of two horses were placed above a group of human graves. The pair of horses here was represented by the head and hooves, probably originally attached to hides. The same ritual, using the hide with the head and lower leg bones as a symbol for the whole animal, was used for many domesticated cattle and sheep sacrifices at Kilikovinsk. Horse images carved from bones are placed in the above ground orb deposit at Siaz Hay and occurred at several other sites of the same period in the middle and lower Volga region. Together, these archaeological clues suggest that horses had a symbolic importance in the Kilikovinsk and Samara culture that they had lacked earlier and that they were associated with humans, domesticated cattle and domesticated sheep. Thus, the earliest phase in the domestication of the horse might have begun during the period 4800 to 4400 BCE. However, there is disagreement over the definition of the term domestication. One interpretation of domestication is that it must include physiological changes associated with being selectively bred in captivity and not merely tame. It has been noted that traditional people worldwide, both hunter-gatherers and horticulturalists, routinely tame individuals from wild species, typically by hand-rearing infants whose parents have been killed and these animals are not necessarily domesticated. On the other hand, some researchers look to examples from historical times to hypothesize how domestication occurred. For example, while Native American cultures captured and rode horses from the 16th century onwards, most tribes did not exert significant control over their breeding. Thus, the horses developed a genotype and phenotype adapted to the uses and climatological conditions in which they were kept making them more of a land race than a planned breed, as defined by modern standards, but nonetheless domesticated. A difficult question is if domesticated horses were first ridden or driven. While the most unequivocal evidence shows horses first being used to pull chariots in warfare, there is strong, though indirect evidence for riding occurring first, particularly by the bowtie. Bit wear may correlate to riding, though as modern headgear demonstrates, horses can be ridden without a bit by using rope and other materials to make equipment the fastens around the nose, so the absence of evidence of early riding in the record does not settle the question. Thus, on one hand, logic suggests that horses would have been ridden long before they were driven, but it is also far more difficult to gather evidence of this, as the materials required for riding, simple riding headgear or blankets, would not survive, and other than tooth wear from a bit, the skeletal changes in an animal that were ridden would not necessarily be particularly noticeable. Direct evidence of horses being driven is much stronger. On the other hand, others argue that evidence of bit wear does not necessarily correlate to riding. Some theorists speculate that a horse could have been controlled from the ground by placing a bit in the mouth, connected to a lead rope, and leading the animal while pulling a primitive wagon or plow. Since oxen were usually relegated to this duty in Mesopotamia, it is possible that early plows might have been attempted with a horse, and a bit may indeed have been significant as part of agrarian development, rather than as warfare technology. The first uses of horses in warfare occurred over 5,000 years ago, 
with the earliest evidence of horses ridden in warfare dating from Eurasia between 4000 and 3000 BCE. A Sumerian illustration of warfare from 2500 BCE depicts some type of equine pulling wagons. By 1600 BCE, improved harnesses and chariot designs made chariot warfare common throughout the ancient Near East, and the earliest written training manual for war horses was a guide for training chariot horses written about 1350 BCE. The effectiveness of horses in battle was also revolutionized by improvements in technology, including the innovation of the saddle, the stirrup, and later, the horse collar. Many different types and sizes of horses were used in war, depending on the form of warfare. The type used varied whether the horse was being ridden or driven, and whether they had been used for reconnaissance, cavalry charges, raiding, communication, or supply. Throughout history, mules and donkeys, as well as horses, played a crucial role in providing support to armies in the field. By around 2500 BCE, the use of horses in warfare had become common throughout the Near East and Egypt. This development was made possible by advances in both the design of chariots, in particular the innovation of the spoked wheel, which replaced the solid wooden wheel and reduced the chariot's weight, and the introduction of all metal bits, which gave chariot drivers more control over their horses. Chariots acted largely as mobile archery platforms, with their bulkier, four-wheeled chariots being used to carry kings into battle, or to allow generals to observe the fighting. Lighter two-wheeled versions, such as those found in Tutankhamun's tomb, were better suited to carrying a single archer and a driver. One of the most informative sources for the use of chariot horses in the ancient Near East is a tablet discovered in 1906-1907 in the Royal Archive at the Hittite site of Hatsua in Antolia. The Kikulu text written in Suniform script and dating to around 1400 BC is named after its author. Kikuli introduces himself in the first line as a horse trainer from the land of the Mitanni, a state in what is now northern Syria and southeastern Turkey. He then describes an approximately 184 day training cycle that begins in the fall, in which he includes instructions for the horse's feeding, watering and care, recommending stable rest, massages and blankets. For nearly a millennium, war horses were used almost exclusively to pull chariots, but after about 850 BC, chariot riding began to decline. Horses, however, never lost their usefulness in battle. Within about 150 years, cavalry, which is suitable to almost any train, virtually replaced chariotry in the Near East, and eventually, horse-drawn chariots were employed primarily for racing, in ceremonial parades, and as a prestige vehicle. The rise of true cavalry was the determining force behind many of the major events that influenced European history. Brian Fargan of the University of California said that the most important development in history with respect to animals was the adoption of the horse as a weapon of war. The type of horse used for various forms of warfare depended on the work performed, the weight a horse needed to carry or pull, and distance travelled. Weight affects speed and endurance, creating a trade-off. Armour added protection, but added weight reduces maximum speed. Therefore, various cultures had different military needs. In some situations, one primary horse was favoured over all others. In other places, multiple types were needed. Warriors would travel to battle riding a lighter horse of greater speed and endurance, and then switch to a heavier horse with greater weight-carrying capacity when wearing heavy armour in actual combat. Lightweight horses were used for warfare that required speed, endurance, and agility. To move quickly, riders had to use lightweight tack and carry relatively light weapons such as bows, light spears, javelins, or later rifles. This was the original horse used for early chariot warfare, raiding, and light cavalry. Relatively light horses were used by many cultures, including the ancient Egyptians, the Mongols, the Arabs, and the Native Americans, who each favoured speed and agility over more heavily armoured but much slower horses. Medium weight horses developed as early as the Iron Age, with the needs of various civilizations to pull heavier loads such as chariots capable of holding more than two people, and, as light cavalry evolved into heavy cavalry, carry heavily armoured riders. The Scythians were among the earliest cultures to produce taller, heavier horses. Larger horses were also needed to pull supply wagons, and later on, artillery pieces. In Europe, horses were also used to a limited extent to manoeuvre cannons on the battlefield as part of a dedicated horse artillery units. With the ability to ride the horse and to domesticate it for food, Horse-centred human cultures emerged in places like the steppe of Central Asia. Horses and riders, or horse-drawn carts or chariots, could cover huge distances at great speed. As trade routes developed, 
Roads were built to move horses and chariots more quickly. Horse-mounted messengers on a Persian emperor's royal road in the 5th century BCE could carry a message 1,700 miles in 7 days, compared with 90 days by foot. There is nothing in the world that travels faster than these Persian couriers, wrote the Greek historian Herodotus. The domestication of the horse signalled a major innovation in transport, communication and warfare. Humans could travel further and could carry much more with them. Horseback riders also carried messages, increasing collective learning, as information changed hands. The speed at which humans could travel increased to that of a horse's walk, trot or gallop, a range of about 4 miles per hour to 55 miles per hour. Using horses for transportation changed the course of history. People could travel widely to find good land for crops or grazing land for their livestock when grass was sparse. Before the industrial era, horse transportation was the ideal way to carry people and goods around the countryside and in cities. The horse and wheel gave a great boost to man's ability to move goods from place to place. A man can carry about 50 pounds, a horse can pack 200 pounds, but a horse and wheeled vehicle can transport up to twice the horse's own weight. Consequently, a 1,000 pound horse could move 2,000 pounds of cargo. It allowed people to go much further at a faster speed, and although we have only spoken about the evolution and domestication of the horse, the horse changed histories in many marvellous ways. Simply put, the horse has had an impact on the world, everywhere it went and on every aspect of life. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this episode of The World of Stuff. If you did, feel free to check out some of my other episodes. I hope you have a wonderful week. Thank you, and take care.